the meeting is being recorded. So welcome everyone to this webinar on buildings, materials, and preservation, log and masonry with somewhat of a focus on the Appalachian region. Our presenter today is Dr. Carol Van West. He's currently serving as Tennessee State Historian and is the co-chair of the Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission as well as director of the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area. So Dr. West has quite a lot to share with us this afternoon. I will let him take it away in just a moment. Um, I think that for some reason Dr. West cannot hear me, so I'm going to go ahead and, and chat to him to get everything started. Um, just one quick note of housekeeping. There is a handout for today's webinar. I It's um, pretty much a, a copy of the slides for the webinar, but you can go ahead and download that as a PDF. So in the, it should be in the upper left hand corner of your screen. And um, I am going to go ahead and pass things on over to Dr. West. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And I will talk to you again at the end. OK, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you're ready for an interesting journey as we look at different uh, approaches, property types that we associate with really is sort of the upper south. I have tried to give it a good Appalachian uh, flavor to what you're looking at today. But keep in mind that, you know, so much in the south is um, it crosses the different regions of the south. I mean, I heard a comment made about that there are several folks who had been at the West Virginia Museums meeting. Well, you well know this. Uh, you know, West Virginia was uh, for the first part of its history, part of Virginia, and the influence from all of that region into the rest of the South is pronounced. In fact, as I work more and more in different parts of the South, particularly the Deep South, you just see that sort of transition, just like the people themselves were moved or moved themselves to different parts of the South. So did they bring with them building types and building approaches that they're very comfortable with. Now, I also ask everyone to sort of bear with me. This is something I love to talk about, and it was real honored to do this for uh, the the group, but you know this is a sort of different type of technology for me. Some of you who know me know that I'm very much a sort of field person. That if we could go to each of these places, we would have a lot of fun. But I'll try to translate this through the images as we move along. So if we can, uh, if I can remember how to move to the next image, we'll move to the next image. So it should okay. work just by clicking right, the right. Got ah, got it. I had to. I had to find it just for a second. Sorry. So let's just start with some basics of the Southern building traditions. And again, you know, this the the phrase "the South" is always problematic, isn't it? Because what you have going on on the coast, say in the Chesapeake or in the Low Country, is really different than what's going on in Appalachia or the Mid South or the Upper South, or then the Mississippi Valley. But I do see some things that are really common, and I think just good rules to keep in mind, that so many of these buildings from the early period, you know, they're relying on visual and oral traditions. It's what they remembered seeing in their homelands, or maybe in their first settlement areas, or places that they perhaps traveled to or visited. And builders are not drawing plans for a lot of these buildings that we'll look at today. They're learning as apprentices, as uh, carpenters, who then decide to build buildings. So it's very much a visual, visual and oral tradition that's passed down. But because of that, I think there's also some continuity in a lot of these forms. Um, I mean, a, a central hall house is a central hall house, no matter where it is in the South. Now, one thing that does, of course, affect is the climate and, and geography. 
we do have these different reason, regions. I know I've been working recently with the uh, Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in North Carolina, and for years they carried on their seminars that there were three distinct regions of the South. Well, uh, I think now they have accepted there might be like six or seven, and there could be even more. And southern climate varies tremendously from the low country regions and into Florida, then what you have into the Appalachian regions. And then again, the Mississippi Valley is uh, something that is a more Midwestern climate on the upper end of the valley. And then down in um, Louisiana, it's very much, again, the coastal climate of that region. But wherever you are in the South, you're going to have this interplay between culture and function, between what people bring with them, their own perceptions of what makes a good house, their own needs as far as making a class statement, their own ability to shape their environment. Because, again, before 1865, you've got a situation where a large segment of the southern population doesn't have a lot of power about where they live or what they do. And, and enslaved people brought traditions with them that sometimes they could replicate and then sometimes not. Function is one of those things that, to me, drives a lot of what we see as well in that, hey, we're in a place that has a lot of timber. We know what we brought perhaps from southwest Pennsylvania. And we're looking at this log tradition and there's someone who knows how to do these log houses. And we can sort of build as our income grows and our family grows. And you see a lot of almost building block houses, as I like to talk about them, places that began as one thing and they become something else. So when you think about all of these different factors put together, it's a real interesting mix. And we can talk about certain Southern types, but boy, there's always variations. And in some ways, it's the variations that make it all worthwhile. So I'm going to start before I get into conservation, much like I try to always talk to any student group or just community group. You know, first know your property type, know sort of what you're dealing with in this architectural and historical context, and then try to find out as much as you can before you even get to the role of how do we take our first steps towards preservation. So. Let's look at the single pin cabin. It is something that in many ways, uh, folklorists and architectural historians in the 1930s, as they encountered Appalachia during the New Deal projects and places like Great Smoky Mountain National Park or Skyline Drive, all of those different major projects, while well, they're encountering these log cabins, and they want to actually restore those and sanitize them in many ways because this was real America. This was the real frontier. This was the Anglo-Saxon building traditions. And this is still this sort of roots of Southern culture. And the log cabin had be, been a political symbol, of course, since the age of Jackson. And it doesn't really change any. The idea that everyone was born in a single pin cabin. When I first started my own work in this many years ago, it was almost like, you know, how much of this is real? How much of this is sort of a myth? Well, that's where some of the more recent work I've done in the Civil War, uh, well, it's sort of true. Uh, and Tennessee has this remarkable set of primary sources. Uh, about 40 years after the Civil War was over, they, the State Library and Archives decided to survey surviving veterans. And one set of the questions was, what type of house did you grow up in? What was it like? You know, how was it made? And it's, you know, 2,000 of these responses document log buildings. So many of these Civil War veterans, the common soldiers of the time, Grew up in single pin cabins, or maybe dog trots, or maybe variations of that. 
So you learn that, yeah, it is a frontier type that is built with first settlement. It gave you a shelter. It also gave you some place to clear land. You had to clear land in many of these regions. And then it's a strong, flexible building. It's a, basically an open pen. And you can do with it in many ways. So you found ways to use those buildings into you know, the future. So they're around and we have to think about them. But they were a real building block of this early architectural traditions in the South. So how they grow over time becomes interesting. And I will always give a nod, nod back to Henry Glassy and some of his work of the 1970s and particularly his very useful study, Folk Housing of Middle Virginia, where he went into some central Virginia counties and really did intensive field work on how many log buildings remain there. And he found that first there was persistence that you know some of these buildings dated to basically the close of the 19th century. Not everything was from the early period in Virginia. And then also how they served as building blocks. Now, we don't need to go into all of Glassy's uh, formulations on what the building blocks tell us. But in brief, the center, the single pin dwelling could easily be adapted into larger structures. So that's where the phrase the dog trot comes from. And I must admit that I think Tennessee is to blame for the dog trot becoming a popular phrase. Uh, it was used a lot in this state by early scholars and it is sort of stuck, but really they're central passage homes. It's a two single pin cabins connected by a common gable roof with their exterior end chimneys and a central passage. Now the example on the screen is from Hancock County, Tennessee, which I chose deliberately, it's up at the corner of where almost Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia meet. And it's a, it's a late example of the style. It's a 1890s home that was built in the Melungeon community. The Melungeons are a mixed race group of, uh, that have existed in this sort of niche of the Upper East Tennessee for many, many decades and they take great pride in their sort of ethnic identity today. At one time, that was a term of derision, but not anymore. So this house from the 1890s serves that community today as a museum. And, you know, they have added that front porch to it that you can see. That would not have been there probably original. It would have really been an open passage that you just stepped through. And yeah, the idea of a central passage between two rooms on either side, that is similar to what the Scots-Irish and English building traditions of a center hall house were all about. So again, to early settlers, this all made sense. Now, there is some examples, and I see Karen Hudson is, is part of this today, and Karen could probably have her own seminar on what she has seen in Kentucky over the years. Um, I know in Tennessee, I have been able to document a few homes that started as a single pin house and added first the dog trot form and then added rooms on top of the first floor rooms and you end up with the two story center hall house. And one of those is the Houston house there on the left side of your screen. Uh, the Houston house began with that room in the sort of bottom right corner as a single pin cabin. It, the house then expanded to a dog trot at the time of the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee removal in the late 1830s. And that gives us our first real sense of documentation of the house at that time. And then by the time of the Civil War, the second floor had been added. And then the portico that you see, the two-story um, front porch with the classical columns, that comes from the colonial revival period of the early 20th century. So this is a, a real house that has evolved 
in building block style over a hundred years. And it's important in this community today because this community is a rural place. It's had one U.S. congressman in its history, and this is where this guy lived. So it was sort of the grand house of the early 20th century that began as a log cabin. But other Central Hall houses were just like they are in Virginia or in North Carolina or South Carolina. They're purpose-built Center Hall houses that are very stylish. And I used the Severe Susong house in Greenville. Uh, Valentine Severe was a brother of John Severe, who would go on to fame and fortune as an early Tennessee governor, and then as a, you know, one of the war hawks of the War of 1812 and many other different things. And his brother, though, was very much a merchant. He had this house built in downtown Greenville um, about 1830. And it's got that federal style front entrance. The central hall is real clear because then on the other side are two well-lit rooms with two pairs of windows. And this form is what you see often with the I house. Uh, the one on the left, the Houston house, is a three bay or three openings across the front, where the Severe house has five bays. And you tend to find the five bay houses being with the more successful planner class or merchant class, whereas the Houston house with that three bay look is very much one of those building block types of uh, dwellings. Okay, so the Central Hall is real dominant in the South. You can find many different examples. I like to use the DeVault Tavern down in the bottom right corner as an example of this. It's a real interesting building that's up in Upper East Tennessee outside of Jonesboro. And it's interesting because of its architecture. That two-story portico dates to about 1825 to 1830. And it's almost Palladian in its sort of treatment. So it's stylized. And then the blockiness of it, as you see the floor plan up above, it's like it came right out of Colonial Williamsburg. It's always reminded me in its basic dimensions of the Wythe House, that one of the famous uh, historic buildings there at Williamsburg, where you've got a central hall with the staircase at the back, and then you've got equal size rooms on either side of that. And it's also interesting to me because sometimes it's still difficult in historic preservation terms to get people interested in these places. Uh, about six years ago, this house was threatened with demolition because everyone just thought, well, it's just another old house and wasn't, uh, you know, had too many problems. And that's where this other part of the seminar today hopefully will be useful to you. We were able to go in with the owners and sort of talk about common sense, practical ways to approach some of the issues. And the house is still with us today. So the I house or this with and they use that phrase because the two end chimneys sort of are like an I, if you think about it for a second, but really it's a two-story central hall house and the central hall plan is so dominant in this region's um, domestic architecture. Now there are other variations of course, and I always love these, the saddlebag house, because I always thought it was a sort of silly description, much like dog trot. Well, we have a central passage and a bunch of dogs running around. Well, okay, the saddlebag, we have a central chimney and two pins on either side of that chimney. But this all had to do with how do you build a bigger house when you build with logs? Because notch logs are hard to connect. But if you just sort of have them beside each other, it starts to work. So the saddlebag was a way of having a central chimney where you didn't build two chimneys on either end. You actually built the chimney in the middle with two flues, and then you could heat two rooms. Um, 
got, I've seen a lot of these in Appalachia. I use examples, though, from other parts of Middle Tennessee just to um, show you how much you can find this. The one on the right is a reproduction done by the Works Progress Administration for the Natchez Trace Parkway in the 1930s. And, you know, it's a, a really good example of the type. There's a bunch of live buildings like this, you know, historic buildings that I have dealt with. And I just think this is such a good example of what that form is like. But it was a translation in some ways of the central chimney two-room cottage that came out of Ireland. And that's the reason on the left I showed a black and white photograph I took of Rogana. Uh, Rogana is a cottage in Sumner County, Tennessee, that was built by Hugh Rogan. Rogan came over to the state at the time of the American Revolution, settled in this part of the South after coming first to Philadelphia. He came down the Great Wagon Road, ends up over it in Middle Tennessee, builds this house, and then decides to go back to Ireland and get his wife, who he left behind 20 years earlier. Well, lo and behold, the wife comes back with him, even though she had figured he was dead and had remarried. And in her honor, he builds her her Irish, Irish cottage, this stone building that you see. So it's got this, the two entrances to two rooms on either side of a grand central chimney. So the saddlebag always reminds me of those Irish cottages that a lot of the settlers, again, knew in their mind's eye and brought with them. Okay, three room plans, you know, this gets into what's the impact of William Penn and his writings for settlers who came from Pennsylvania down the wagon road into West Virginia, into the Shenandoah Valley, and then down into Tennessee where they could either fork and go on into North Carolina or go through the wilderness road up into central Kentucky. So you do find these, they're not as common as the Central Hall house, where you have three interlocking rooms that look like a sort of Central Hall plan house. But one thing you'll see in the photo on the left, where's that other window on the right? To really have that same balance that an eye house would, there should be another bay or set of windows on the right side of the house. And when you see that sort of asymmetrical look to a house, uh, it might not be a three-room plan, but it well might be a three-room plan. Now, some of my friends in the field like to talk about how this is a German-derived plan of a central chimney that is then used in different ways. Okay, I've seen some of that, and I've seen examples of that, particularly in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. But um, I'm not convinced. I, I think this house form needs more study. And um, the Landon Carter house in Elizabethan, which is a 1780s house, would be a real good place to start. But guys, I have tried to work on a grad student for 30 years to take on this property as a master's thesis and haven't won yet. So maybe sometime soon, but not quite. So here's some other examples of that type. Uh, Fort Stover in Page County, Virginia, in the uh, sort of upper Shenandoah, has been demolished. Uh, that was a real loss. That was a great example of this type. Set on a hillside so you could have a sort of full basement. And to show you an example of that from Appalachia, here is uh, the Ernest Fort, as it was called, the Fort House. But it was really just the dwelling of Peter Ernst, who anglicized his name to uh, Peter Ernest and lived in this farmhouse along the Nalachucky River near the North Carolina border. And you can see in the image on the right the uh, how it's built into a hillside to get that basement, which usually served as a kitchen space for the house. 
and then the rest of the house is on top of that real heavy basement. So they're there. They're very interesting. I know that I really have never come to grips with this house type myself, but boy, I enjoyed the Ernest house. I've taken many people there. It is the oldest Tennessee century farm in existence. It was uh, started in 1777. And on the other side of the river, when the family expanded their land holdings, they built a center hall, two-story eye house. So it's almost like a little architectural lab when you go up to this part of Greene County, Tennessee. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about some of the Victorian forms that you can find, not just through the South, but actually through large parts of the country after the Civil War. Uh, the gable front and wing house on the left is very much the gable front serves as a wing to what is often a center hall house. And then the two-story version of this, and I show, I use the different images to show how the gable end can be on either end of the house. Well, sometimes those are called upright and wing. You'll see that phrase used by people and in different books. I still like to sort of call these just two-story gable front and wing houses. But if you look at the one here in the bottom in particular, where you can see there's the central entrance, and then on either side, there's a bay, a single bay. You know, this isn't far removed from that Houston house that we looked at a few minutes ago. Now, also, I needed to say I felt something about shotgun houses, which are always viewed as an African-American form. And... John uh, Michael Vlatch, many years ago, traced their West African and Caribbean influences. But one thing that you will find throughout the South is that the shotgun house isn't just New Orleans. It's not just coastal. It's working class, and it's built into the 20th century. And it could serve as housing for both whites or blacks. Uh, one of the more interesting sets of bungalows I have ever seen were built in Beaumont, Texas in the 1940s. Um, typically, they're framed. You know, they're just three interconnected rooms. There's no hallway. You walk through that front door there behind that man sitting on his porch, and you walk from one room to the next to the next, and then you're out the back door. So they're working class housing, and you find this throughout the South. Um, it's just in New Orleans, they really sort of celebrate them. In the rest of the South, we, I think, ignore them, except perhaps in Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis was born in a shotgun. And I tell you guys that this just proves that you can never talk about Southern history without having uh, a uh, reference to Elvis. That just goes with the territory, right? Um, okay, now let me now switch into thinking about how do we preserve these places? And I, I'm sort of old school. And I go back to Harvey McGee's thinking on this whole issue many, many years ago. He wrote a very influential book about restoring historic buildings. But I think even though he was writing in the days before modern technology and, um, you know, not the day that we, not what we can do today when we analyze buildings, still think he has it right that a building is a system where everything is sort of interrelated. And you do have to understand the, the qualities, the characteristics of these different materials and the, their function within the building and the function in, within the living space. But you always need to sort of think of the whole thing. I think sometimes in conservation we get so 
caught up in our own specialized knowledge. We sometimes don't communicate with our peers, and what solves one problem ends up causing a problem somewhere else. And we have encountered so many instances of this throughout the years. I just feel like you always have to tell people that. And particularly important things like foundations and roofs. I think one of the more interesting things that I have encountered in the last 10 years is this predilection that people want to put these permanent mud roofs onto these buildings and then they want to use sort of heavy materials because well it'll last forever but then the roof is actually was never designed to handle such a heavy roof and they end up causing problems immediately and it was like well yeah you may be saved to cost there but now you've got problems elsewhere so i think mcgee's general rule is important to follow and then i always like to encourage people to look beyond the walls and the roof and think about that overall landscaping that the building is in. Uh, drainage is one of the biggest problems that buildings have. When they have conservation problems, that's one of the first things I look for. And I have been called in some ways, well, you're just a, a water determinist. You want to know where the water is getting in, and that's the source of all the problems. Well, I don't want to really it that bluntly. But we are in the south where you get a lot of rain, and if you don't take care of the rain, you're going to have problems with your building. So we, when we take people onto properties, we try to show them, we try to get them to always think in terms of the building as a whole, but then how the building reacts as well to its surroundings and the landscaping around it. And then the first step we try to get them to do, don't just listen to us. Take down notes. Take your iPhone. Take a photograph of these things so you've got points of reference for future repairs. That's important, too. So here, for example, is a very important building um, on the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the uh, Hare Conrad Cabin. We listed this in the National Registers years ago, and it's got a real interesting historic context because the family who received this Cherokee land after Cherokees were forcibly removed have owned it ever since, and they actually let people onto the property to serve as a, um, uh, you know, interpretive site. I wouldn't really call it a museum. They have some different things there, but they share the building with the community, and then they use it themselves. Well, you know, they've added on some lean-tos to the right there that really doesn't help anything at, at all, and uh, we have recommended that they remove that. But one of the biggest recommendations that really upset them wasn't removing the lean-to, but it was cutting back the trees cutting back the foliage around at the foundations because it meant, you know, ripping out grandma's flower beds. And, you know, grandma was a great person, no doubt, but, you know, these things trap moisture and trap moisture near those historic logs that are still holding up the building wonderfully. You don't want to lose that. And then the trees, they really got upset with that. But I think a bunch of us have been in the field enough to know, yes, beautiful trees also mean beautiful heavy limbs that can crush these types of buildings um, in any type of storm because that's another part of Appalachia. Uh, tornadoes. We have them, and you have to sort of plan for high winds, particularly with a building of this importance and age. This is probably about an 1820 building. It could easily be. Um, 200 years old, but again, very important association with the Cherokee Trail of Tears. So when we start these projects, we also encourage people to find history and to dig into history. And this is something I really try to get across to my graduate students, how important that is, because 
by knowing the history of who's living there and maybe how function changed, you start to understand problems or issues you encounter when you start to dissect the building. That if you just go into a restoration project without a historical context, uh, you see things that don't make much sense, but then if you sort of know the history chronology of the property, it still might not make any sense, but at least it makes sense from the standpoint of why they did what they did and when they did it, which helps you understand maybe the longevity or the lack of longevity of the change. So this is something that just basic research has to go with restoration, we feel. Um, and it's not just going to see the local librarian or the local historian who may know the story, but may have it wrong just because it's been passed down a certain way. We really emphasize primary source research on all of this. And it's been so much easier to do now because of the explosion of Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org. Um, whichever one you choose to use, uh, I tend to, I have subscriptions to both. FamilySearch.org is free. Um, of course, Ancestry is a paid uh, service. But man, they have so many primary sources loaded in now becomes a good way to see changes in family, changes in land holdings, a lot of things that it would have taken us in just 10 years ago, weeks to put together, you can put together in a couple of days. And also in doing that history, you get to a very important determination you have to do. When you're thinking of these restoration projects, is it worthwhile? Is there enough history left at that property to justify the preservation of it? And then if it is a really important historical story, well, then don't you want to go as light as possible in your restoration? You don't want the restoration to take away the layers of history of where those events or people from that time in the past actually touched that building and shaped it you would want to step back and maybe say, well, this is going to be a light restoration. We'll put visitor services or, you know, the kitchen that you want to have. That needs to be maybe an addition or a separate little connected building uh, because this is really an important place. Now, we have found that, you know, sometimes that can be a tough decision by a family who's been running a farm at this property for many many generations and you know they want to have that modern you know modern conveniences and there's no reason they should and they want to stay within the old house the same with museums you know well we want to interpret the early period we really don't care about the post-civil war period that's not a big emphasis on us so we're thinking in this direction but whatever you do, you want to make sure that you don't undermine that sort of second bullet point. That when, if you could put yourself in the footsteps of those of the past, and they came back to that property in, say, 1840, would they still feel it? Would they feel history there? Is that feeling of history, that setting, the building materials themselves, is there something there that really conveys the past? Or is it all just an interpretive platform? If it's an interpretive platform, to my mind, I come to bullet point four. You really have damaged, if not destroyed, what made the building historic. And you do have nothing but a museum exhibit. So, as an example, and I hate to jump on friends down in uh, north georgia but this is the this is a good example of that this was a building that people were very excited as they started a restoration of an old triple gable front two-story hotel they found on the right side a two-story log building well they knew because of that sign right there they were on the Cherokee Trail of Tears, 
So, hey, can you come and help us sort of understand what's going on? Well, I sure could. And it was a very interesting place indeed because there was a two-story double pin um, log dwelling that had served as the building block for everything that came afterwards. So then, okay, what do you think? Well, let's walk through the building and sort of look at integrity of uh, materials, what's been left, what's been taken out, how solid is the building. They want to open it as a historic site. And it was like, well, I really think you've got the real deal here. There's a lot you can do. And the community decided that, yeah, well, building blocks. Yeah, that's what's happened. We want to get it back to what it was like in 1820. So all of that front now is gone, which is really a sort of interesting, you know, post-Civil War, 1870, 1880 facade. And then of the back, it's all gone except for the two pins. That's all that's left. So you sort of ripped away the context of the building to get to its first story. And I can't really endorse that. It's a lesson that we talk about is privileging one period of the past over another. Certainly you want to have interpretive storylines, but is this all you want to have left? And now the group that had been a community effort on this, they've sort of split and they've had uh, divisions and discussions and people have walked away because, well, we had a historic site. Now we have something else. And that can happen, unfortunately, with projects. Um, but, you know, I don't want to be overly critical because they stepped up and did do something with this. This is a similar building with a similar history uh, up on the Tennessee-Kentucky line. This is just inside the Tennessee line uh, up near Clarksville and again associated with the Trail of Tears. And they did not take care of water issues. You can see up here in this corner. They didn't take care of foliage. They then had trees fall on top of it. And then at the bottom here, you can possibly see some of the foundation problems. And by the time I saw this house, it was actually dangerous to go inside. And it has since collapsed. And I think, you know, you lose in a valuable landmark that way as well. Okay, thinking about integrity again. How do you go forth? This is a brick house, and it's... Just across from Kentucky in Galaganda, Illinois, it's where one of the old river crossings there between Kentucky and Illinois. And, you know, hey, this is our landmark building. It's 1833. That's what that little plaque there up to the right of the door says. And it is one of those sort of central hall houses in that it has a central entrance and then two bays on either side of that, but then obviously it had been changed up a lot. Well, Galaganda is a trade town, and you see this a lot in trade towns wherever, that, you know, houses become businesses, and then they become offices, and then they become offices and businesses, and maybe stores, and that's what happened here. And again, we could trace that history, we could look at the house, you could talk about possible restorations because you did have a good idea of what the facade was like because of the second floor was not boxed around. But then down here below, well, you've got all types of things. You have single pane windows replacing double pane, I mean, uh, double hung, and then you've got a doorway replacing a window. And then over here on the left, you've got a storefront and a door replacing two windows. So, you know, sort of fun things. But we're open to these types of things. We understand buildings change over time and will morph. And in this type of context, it makes sense. So we started looking around and seeing other changes. And then this is this whole thing of, you know, setting. And then there was this in the back. 
Well, this is a whole different creature here. And um, I don't know if I've seen so many different types of roof lines going in different directions on a building in some time. I did sort of enjoy that about it. But then it got to be, well, you've got some, you know, big decisions to make. How do you want to treat these different periods? Are they important? What do you want to do with this building? And I would say right now that's not decided, sort of being discussed because there's big decisions to make. But yeah, the building's lost a lot of integrity, has lost a lot of what made it historic. But I still think it's got probably a story it can tell. So these issues are not easily cut until you get to a place like this. And this has been one of the more interesting southern dwellings we've dealt with this decade. In different guides to Charleston, Tennessee, which was the location of Fort Cass, one of the military, really one of the key military concentration camps of the U.S. Army on the Trail of Tears. Well, you know, it doesn't take much to look at this and say this is no 1830s building. It's sort of that gable front and wing, except then it's got a real stylized Queen Anne type porch wrapping around. It's got that big hip roof does seem to have a lot of integrity to the windows and the bays and the entrances, but this isn't of the 1830s. This is from a later period. Well, the community insisted this was the Lewis Ross house, though. And what did we have to turn to? Because we weren't going to win that argument. This was the Lewis Ross house. Lewis Ross was the brother of John Ross, the chief of the Cherokee Nation. Okay, so we go deep into the research and we find out that it's not, it's the location of the Lewis Ross house and a bit of the foundation. But of course, a later building was built on top. An even more extreme example of this is at the Chieftain's Museum or the Major Ridge House in Rome, Georgia. Now, that house obviously, too, did not exist in 1830. And in 1835, when Major Ridge signed the Treaty of New Echota, which put him into the pantheon of infamy among the Cherokee Nation. But in this case, the room here, sort of right behind the tree, was the log pen that Major Ridge lived in at the time of the treaty signing at New Echota. Then, a uh, Italian rayon company bought the site, transformed that cabin into this colonial revival house in the 1920s, and uh, that's what you had today. So what was interesting in talking with folks here, and this is still unresolved too, I mean, you got this sort of actually quite nicely done 1920s house that has this association with the rayon plant that's very important in this community's history, but it's far removed from being a Cherokee house or any type of log construction. And there are competing visions. Well, we'll just stick with this. This has been a museum now for 10 years. We can tell the story and then others know we need to tear all of that off and end up with the log house. So this is where, you know, integrity, period of significance, materials, restoration just drives everything. And it's an, it's an important discussion. So, you know, you find some of us preservationists probably saying this too much. We always are talking about integrity. Nowadays, that's not a bad thing to be talking about. But also, it really means, does it have still its historical nature? Is it still historic, or has it just been restored to something that is not saying it's not worthwhile, but not what you want? And it's a hard question to do. And I throw up this example of a slave dwelling from northern Alabama. 
because this was a debate. This was part of a large plantation that had been stripped away. As you can see, there's really nothing else in the image at all except a ranch house over on the far left. But this is a brick slave dwelling, one of like a handful, maybe less than five, that still exist in Alabama. So the manor house is gone. All the other outbuildings are gone. No one knows if the cemetery is there. This has been turned into an industrial park sometime in the past. So hasn't this property lost its setting? Does it have its feeling whatsoever? Well, this is, again, where the history matters. This is a slave dwelling built of brick. And we might not know the questions to ask yet. But yeah, this needs to be preserved. So it has been, and it's been listed in the National Register of Historic Places. So again, the, this whole question on whether or not to step forward with restoration, always an issue, always an issue. So I've been in the PowerPoint slides, and that's why I wanted you to have the handout um, so you could have this information. Yeah, it's sort of my perspective. I can think of others who would disagree with me on different aspects of it, but it just sort of makes sense in, the, in our experience of working with the Southern landscape that the integrity of materials is just crucial. If there's been too much replacement or too much repair with modern materials, no matter what the well-meaning approach was, it's just not a historic resource anymore. And by keeping those materials, you're also keeping the integrity of the workmanship to putting together the property. Um, and I think that's important because those are the hands, in many cases, African-American hands, that shape this building. And if you lose that, you just lose a lot of what makes it historic. Now, feeling, I will admit, is intangible. And, you know, how can that one slave dwelling evoke that feeling of that this is historic, the plantation landscape? Well, we argue this a lot with, as I say there, with the properties along the Trail of Tears. It's been a project we've worked on with the Cherokee Nation, the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, and the uh, National Park Service. And I do understand that should be do, do you feel, not do you feel, like you're in the presence of the past. And on, at least on those properties, we actually let the Cherokees give us great guidance on that, what they feel as historic. I think you have to pay attention to it. So that's where in a lot of this, too, we've ended up sort of going the way of community involvement and trying to get their understanding and their assessment of where it's valuable to them. So... You end up with properties like this in North Carolina. Um, the group had asked me to put together, to give it an Appalachian focus. Well, I think as you can see from the setting here, you can't get much more Appalachian than this. It was a dog trot. It's been filled in at some point in the 20th century. You can see the planks just sort of laid across, nailed to the logs, and then with a double hung window in the middle. It still had its separate entrances on either pin, and it still had its separate exterior in chimneys. And this overlooks the North Carolina mountains. Great debate that we've had with different folks about whether or not the date of this building, but obviously it's important. And the heirs of the property wanted to know, should they even care? Because you can also see some of the foundation rot that is set in, that basically logs are on the ground, stuff was grown up all around it, and it probably looked much worse than it does here because they had just cleared this out for us to come in and sort of go over the property with them. So I'm ready to jump into log building preservation basics. 
okay, there's these different questions, different issues, different contexts. Um, now, what do we do? Well, these are the basic problems we've seen with buildings like that, and that building embodied a lot of it. You know, foundation failure. They had not even tried to replace or repair foundation. It was just the original had failed and nothing had been put in its place. Certainly, it had been some additions, but it doesn't have the modern chimney replacement. It didn't have a porch added to it, which is often common. Nor had they used Portland cement. So, you know, we sort of explained that to them. Well, yeah, it needs work, but, you know, you've done a lot of, you you got a clear pathway to doing the job right. That's not so true of other log buildings. Here is one from uh, Georgia, uh, North Georgia, sort of in the Georgian Appalachian. Well, they've added the porch. They've done the Portland cement between the logs. Uh, they've even added some different openings because, well, they just thought they should be there. And then the chimneys, of course, are totally redone in almost a suburban style. That looks like something that would be onto a 1950s house where you wanted to have a, a nice patterned rock chimney. Now, the property has been preserved. It's interpreted. Um, but, you know, they are finding constant problems, particularly with the Portland cement, because that's a hard substance working against a soft substance. It doesn't breathe. It, re it uh, tracks water, keeps water. And uh, a lot of the logs are rotting away. And Portland cement might be the biggest problem we see with so many of the log buildings across the region because we're such a wet climate. And that Portland cement just traps the wetness. And then it pushes against the logs. It's just not a good permanent solution. But we, you cannot move people from that. But I will show you examples of how it could be done. Um, some other common issues we've seen with log buildings. They leave the notched logs at the corners. They extend past the roof line. So they're exposed to rain and runoff. And the notched logs at the corners start to deteriorate. And then that means the joint itself starts to deteriorate. And the building is, is, is made much less stable. Again, I've already hit the point heavy on flower beds and foliage near the building. And then foundations too close to the ground, leading to contract, contact with the ground, or really the building can't breathe adequately, and water is sort of trapped there. And then the additions. This is like that first example I showed you with the lean-to. The big problem with that wasn't that it was a lean-to. It was trapping water against the logs of that one wall so again deterioration sets in so this is what this can look like if it, notches are exposed they start to deteriorate at the ends as you can see and they come apart and then suddenly the whole notch comes apart and the foundation is destabilized um, the image on the right shows the problem with the foliage that actually the ground is then raised to sort of support the foliage and to level out the entrance coming in. We didn't want those steps to be so steep for people. And um, so that was sort of a problem, but it's trapping water around. And again, they have their porch. Um, uh, almost invariably not the original historic treatment. Um, Here's another good example of a porch and the long-term damage the porch did to the foundation of the house. Now, on the other hand, they haven't put the Portland cement in. You could still use sort of traditional wattle and daub and mud and all types of stuff to sort of serve as chinking. Yeah, you have to replace that with some regularity. But it does help to preserve the logs. That's one reason these are in such good shape comparatively. 
but then you can also see the problems with new windows added in. And I mean, this just sort of comes with the territory as people adapt houses. And you've got some real rot underneath that window, which, you know, uh, I don't know what you would do here. We re recommended just replacing these bottom three logs with uh, new logs to help keep the house together. Uh, another issue is that sometimes you get people not realizing, besides the thing about foliage near the house, is okay we wanted to preserve this log cabin it's important to us you don't place it right next to the live railroad tracks because it's just the vibration of heavy freight moving through all the time this house wasn't built in that context wasn't designed to handle constant movement and vibration and you know sometimes you wonder because the community was like well we never thought about that and I just thought, how do you not think about being next to a live railroad track when you don't have to do that? So, you know, it's just interesting, these different issues that you can encounter. And what I did like about this house, though, it still had, the, it, they put it on stone piers. And, you know, so many people want to close these off. Well, we don't want stuff running around. That leads to deterioration. No, actually, it doesn't. They did the stone piers because that lets the logs breathe. And uh, thing and moisture and other stuff doesn't get trapped underneath the house. So, you know, they got, got it partially right. Just wish it wasn't right next to the railroad tracks. Okay, now let me move quickly here because I can see I'm on sort of my last third of my time. And that's repairing damaged logs. Okay. Well, it does all depend. Um, but we tend to always tell people, well, use a consolidant and the right epoxy treatment particularly since you've already sort of botched it up with the Portland cement here in this image from a building in the town I'm sitting in right here from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where they have done this. And because um, you sort of need both. You need something to give the log substance and to keep it from collapsing. And you also need something that keeps it bound together. And by using both of these, you can extend the life of the log but at the same time it's not really a log building anymore it's almost like uh you know a plastic and log building so what we have tended to encourage people to use that is effective but not too expensive is wood epox or a similar type product uh we just ended up uh, we've tried wood epox on different situations and sort of tested that for 10 years now. And I'm, I'm okay with the longer term results, at least 10 years results. You can, people can get this. They can get it and they can apply it themselves. And if they actually mix it some with some pigment or some sawdust, it'll look better with the look of the log and the repair is not so jarring. Um, so, yeah, this is not what you want to do if you've got a building that doesn't have these issues. But if you do, you're going to have to go in this direction. Now, as a good example, let's look at this building from Shiloh National Military Park. Uh, the National Park Service has owned this ever since they acquired the land for Shiloh Park in the 1890s. It was a dwelling of someone who was working the land during the battle. And this is in one of the more heated parts of, of the battlefield, the peach orchard area near the Bloody Pond. If you know any of the history of Shiloh, I've just remarked on two famous landmarks. So everyone knows it's important. It sort of gets at the middle class farmer of uh, western Tennessee down near the Mississippi, northern Mississippi border and what they lived in. 
And certainly, you know, it's had its repairs. The roof has been redone. But what they never did was to use any type of Portland cement. They're still using traditional chinking. Those logs are in great shape. They keep them off the ground with their foundation. It stays open. It's it's just a great building. I just wish the National Park Service would interpret the story of a farmhouse that survives the battle and still there today and what that means. What did the Civil War mean to farmers? You know, it was, um, that's a big story in my mind. But the building is still there and it can tell that story in the future. Okay, so that's what I want to say about logs. And what I want to move to in the last part of this is just masonry restoration and also start to sum up some of the stuff I've been throwing at you. Because I realize in 90 minutes, I'm covering a lot of ground. And I see in my work three golden rules. And, of course, these are used by preservationists all over the country. And uh, I think they're still good guideposts. Although, you know, just like most of this stuff, I can think of two or three people that would have a lively debate with me. You know, preserve rather than repair. And regular maintenance is so important. God, we we talk about that all the time. And sites feel that they're under the gun. They have so many different demands on them. Deferred maintenance is always maybe the best option. Uh, no, it's not, particularly if you're dealing with a log building. Because the more you repair, the more you lose that historic quality of the building. Now, when you do have to repair, you want you want to do that. You don't want to replace with reproductions or new materials. You want to repair. Uh, because again, it sort of keeps some of that workmanship and that original historic character in place. But, you know, if you have to replace, well, do it right. Use the, try to use, you know, if it's log, a similar log, although I know yellow poplar that was used so much in the South is hard to get a hold of, but you don't have to use cedar. You can use something that maybe is a better match for that. And you want to get somebody hand hewning your logs is, if that's how they were done. Because just that feel to the log of when it's been hand hewn instead of machine cut is telling and it helps to convey the story. So, you know, we realize sometimes you do have to replace, but you want to be careful when you do it, and you want to do it right. Okay, masonry. This is something that, well, I, I feel what I'm saying about masonry is just, you can find throughout the country. Um, the biggest mistake, and, and you think, and some of you guys at preservation, it's, oh, no one says that anymore. We run into this every year. Well, can't we just, you know, use abrasive cleaning techniques? We're going to use a power hose on this, and we're going to do this. We still hear sandblasting. Is, don't you think that's the way to do this? And, of course, what all of that abrasive cleaning techniques does is to wipe off the original sort of veneer, the, sub, the surface of the material, and that lets water in. It is so dangerous in our part of the world because of our climate, and this is what causes most problems with masonry buildings that we see. Um, because, I tell you, when you work in buildings from 1820 to 1860 in particular, in, in my part of the South, you come away so impressed with the craftsmanship abilities of the African-American slaves. These brick buildings are well built. They're almost sometimes overbuilt. They're solid. And if you don't muck them up, they're going to be there for a long time. Not this building here, this is in Georgia, but a similar style building in Tennessee. It almost burned down, and the fire marshal, this was in Nashville, said, 
to me. He says, wow, you know, this thing was going. And then it hit the back brick wall. It was the L edition that burned down. It was built later. It hit this right back brick wall, and it just sort of couldn't penetrate that. Why would that be? It's like, because they'd had African Americans who built this house. We actually know some of the names. They were good builders. They built this thing solid. So masonry is something that can be with us for a long time if we just don't make bad choices. So it usually comes up with cleaning. Well, you know, it doesn't look good. This is an 1850s brick wall, which they were concerned about. And, of course, it was moisture issues that they wouldn't address had led to these problems. Well, if you want to clean it, first test it on a part that maybe is not so much public, but just a small part of it. Because you want to see if it does actually clean it, and then does it cause any problems. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Don't treat it all at the same time. Test it. See what works because different, I mean, bricks are just made of all different types of materials and composition. So sometimes you sort of have to experiment to figure it out. And you certainly want to be gentle when you do this. Now, I do get criticized by contractors and they're rightful, they're right to do it in that well, Dr. West, we don't have all of the legions of graduate students and stuff that you can put to a building and they sit there and just wash it by hand. Well, this is true, but you're also being paid real big money to do your projects, and we're not, and it still is the best way to do it. Um, you know, throw away your Brillo pads. Don't use those. Use some... You know, good old just hand labor. Uh, it won't get everything out. But then the big thing is you're not going to damage the surface. And that, to me, is the biggest danger, not having it pristine looking, but damaging that surface. So, again, we still will, I feel like I have to always say something about sandblasting because we still run into it and people who are at local historic sites are often being told, it's okay, it, it's okay, we know how to do it, particularly when they do it in the wet abrasive cleaning. See, we're just not gonna blast it with air, we're using it with water. Well, you know, it's just not appropriate. Whatever type of blasting it is, so I threw in this slide so you can see those terms that contractors use. Sandblasting, you might well know, yeah, I don't want to do that. Well, bead blasting, wheel blasting, bristle blasting, oh, that all might be good. Because, you know, water is really the cleaning agent and it's not. No, you're still using some type of abrasive material that you shoot onto the brick at a high rate of speed. It's gonna damage it. It's just not a good step. And I feel the same about high pressure water cleaning. Now, you know, the the huh, contractors who clean houses, well, we use this on vinyl all the time. Well, you know, I don't really care what you use on vinyl, but the high pressure jets are too, too strong. You just don't wanna do it. And then whatever you do, you don't want to do it when it's cold. Now, sometimes we run into things, hey, but we're selling this property and we're going to have it look better and we're doing it now. But, you know, whenever you do this work, don't do it when it's cold because, you know, even if you do it right, you're still in, in introducing more water to the surface. It can, it can get into cracks. It freezes. It expands. It's not good. Okay, well then, what do we do with when we replace mortar? And this is a Western Kentucky dwelling that had had big time water issues. It had big time foliage issues where they just decided, well, we'll just let the vines grow up through the bricks. That's pretty. Well, all of that pulls stuff apart, and the wall was really buckling. So yeah, they needed to address this issue, and. 
you have to replace it. You have to repair it. An important step to take. Well, you don't want to end up replacing it like this. This is another Western Kentucky building where it's all, um, you know, it looks like a ranch house um, elevation. You know, it looks like a 1970s thing. You want to get it somewhat right. So, you know, be careful when you, re when you repair your mortar. Okay, moisture issues. I know I've brought this up already, and after an hour and 15 minutes of me badgering you, you're tired of hearing about moisture issues. But it does, it is so important. And here on this dwelling, which was a slave dwelling in uh, Rogersville, Tennessee, up in Appalachia, and they were quite proud of how well they had kept it up and preserved it as they should be. But then they were like, well, yeah, but we really like the ivy growing. Well, you know, I was able to show them the image of the ivy growing on this and the sort of long-term damage it had caused on West, in western Kentucky. One of the reasons iPhones are so great now, guys, you can carry these images of good practices and bad practices with you to show people. Instead of saying, I'm going to send you something later, you can have it with you. And, you know, this is, again, a guttering issue because gutters are being blocked. The foliage is retaining moisture when it rains. Not good. And, you know, this is what happens to all buildings when you don't address issues like big holes in the roof, foundations rotting away, the building just starts to collapse. And even if it's a, as this is, an 1850s building, not very early, but it was very important in this community's history. And they were saying, well, what do we do with this? Well, you've got a lot of hard work ahead of you. You're going to have to repair some of this. Some of these uh, clabberding can be reused and uh, saved, but you're going to have to sister it together. In other words, combine new elements with some of the old elements to make it work. So I know this has all been real quick and, and breezy, uh, but I do want to, again, leave you re recommendations. And it's also why I've given you the PowerPoint handout. You don't have to write these down. You have them there in that handout. Um, what to do with all of these issues with brick? Well, when you clean out the masonry joints to replace that, you know, hand rake it. Use something with natural bristles, not metal bristles, that can further damage the brick. And then this is where we actually encourage you to turn to science. Turn to people who can help you recreate as close as you can the mortar. Now, one, one group that's been very helpful to us are county extension agents. Because I've decided in Tennessee they can still get the University of Tennessee to do pretty much whatever they need to be done. And they, we there's this one agent in particular who I'd never thought about this. Well, I can send that mortar off to the labs and we'll find out how it was put together. And it's like, well, are you the greatest person in the world or what? So it was very useful to be able to match it, you know, at least have an idea of how it was put together. But, you know, that's going to be difficult to do in many things. How do you do that, the science of that, and, and getting, you know, paying for the science to do it. I understand the science, but paying for it, finding someone willing to do that, that might be a bit much. But you can try to replicate the strength of the historic mortar. That you make sure that the mortar is softer once it hardens than the brick and stone. You know, you don't want it harder because that stresses the brick. So this little dance you have to do with labs and contractors and experts, I know that's where I really do turn to 
experts because boy if you replace the mortar with a hard mortar that then damages the brick then the problems get to be endless you do not have a sustainable conservation solution here and you want to end up with that and you don't have to address an entire wall this is one thing that does drive me a bit crazy well you know repair the damage section leave the historic mortar elsewhere in place even though, well, that just doesn't look right. Well, you know what it tells people, and a lot of owners like this, you telling your neighbors and everyone else, you repaired this wall and you did it right, and you respected what came before you. Oh, well, yeah, that's sort of where I want to be. Uh, of course, some people want it all to look the same. But, you know, it's, it's historic. It's masonry. It changes over time. Change over time is not bad as long as you're taking it in an approach that is sustainable, that that building can be there for another 50 years, 100 years, or even more. I know a recent case that I had was uh, where people, you know, were showing me this issue. How stupid were they? They cut across the logs in this staircase here which is sort of hanging it wasn't even fully supported and i said well yeah but you know it worked for 100 years that's a 100 year uh, repair job and then it was like yeah that's not so dumb after all so you know be respectful of how past work was done in whatever restoration you're taking on because you see the problems constantly you know here you know with bricks deteriorating in fact bricks starting to disintegrate the discoloring of bricks because of it clearly moisture problems on this building here so you know this issue of repointing the historic masonry is important these are some of the rules i sort of throw out and just want to emphasize again just like when you're cleaning it don't do it when it's cold and um because you just won't get a good sort of read on the building. And nor do you want to do it when it's too hot because then the mortar dries too quickly. And again, you just don't get a good sort of match between the brick and the mortar. So my last words, and I guess by now I've probably worn you out, but you know, don't use waterproofing. Still people recommend it, I run into this. Well, we're going to waterproof this wall. No, you're not. It's just not good. Um, changes appearance because the chemical composition of those things don't usually match. Accelerates deterioration. And don't patch a brick or stone wall with stucco or cement. Repair it correctly. It'll last longer. Not only will it look good, it's a longer lasting repair. If we could get through to our contractor friends at Cements, not the answer to everything, it would be a much better world. And it can be, guys. I mean, again, they've done a nice job with this house to a degree. There's still issues. That's why they brought us up. But, you know, here's a house that means a lot to this mountain community of Appalachia. It's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship in a beautiful place. So that means I think the work that we do is worthwhile and it's fun doing it. So thank you for your attention. Um, I hope I haven't driven you totally crazy with this webinar today. Thank you so much. So we do have just a few minutes left, um, but if you have questions, if you wanna go ahead and type them in the chat box, I'm sure that Dr. West will be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, Mark wants to know, is a house ever beyond saving? Sometimes it is. But then it, that's where the historical judgment is. Boy, if it's really important to that community, um, I would say, let's do it. And I have an example in tomorrow's webinar that is coming out of the Deep South. It's Muddy Waters, a log cabin where he was born and grew up.
And the decision was made in the 1990s. Well, you know, it was a log house. Three of the walls still were there, but the fourth one had collapsed. It's not worth saving. You know, I don't know. It was Muddy Waters' birthplace, and he was born in a log cabin in the 20th century. I would think maybe I'd take the plunge there. Yeah, the, uh, Susan wants to know the issue of paint on brick, including painting brick that was not previously painted. We strongly discourage that. Um, I do think that, um, it, you know, it changes appearance. Brick wasn't meant to be painted in most cases, not all, but most cases. We particularly have problems with uh, design review boards that allow painting a press brick. Press brick is a more condensed brick that's not meant to be painted for sure. And when you do it actually undermines what the the brick is all about. So that does have some variation on it. And once it's painted though, I tend to think you don't try to take it off because by taking it off you could damage that surface and then you've got long-term problems. We've just encouraged that with the RCA Studio A building in Nashville, which was a yellow brick building. And at places, the yellow brick still survives. But, you know, they decided in the 80s that was too garish. So they painted it dark green. And the owners would like to take it back to that sort of mid-century modern look of the yellow brick. but. You know, it's just like, I can't encourage that. And frankly, that was where I recently encountered the thing. Well, we can sandblast that off. It's like, no, you can't. This isn't now a, a national register, national significance building. You're going to leave it alone. All right, any other final questions, comments, or thoughts? All right, I think we are ready to just about wrap up. So thank you so much, Dr. West. That was extremely informative, lots and lots of information. I hope the participants were able to, to gain something from that and um, definitely follow up by downloading the handout and um, taking a closer look. So thank you to Dr. West. Thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon and had great questions and comments and everything. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks. OK, you're welcome. <laughs>